Rabbi Katz, I think we all know you, but I'll just say very briefly that you are the head of the Talmud department here at YCT, uh, and in many ways, uh, the Rebbe of many of us uh, in many, many different contexts. You taught all over the world, many different ways, many different areas of Torah. Um, and I want to thank you for being here tonight with us. And I want to ask you the question. Maybe I don't have to stay this whole time and, and to wait till the end. Who is the most important guest at the Seder? I, I, I want to <laughs> leave with that. I'm excited to learn from you tonight. So Baruch Haba. And just a reminder, you've got about, about 40 minutes or so. And then we're going to begin our conversation with Rabbi Dr. Sharon Shalom. Uh, in about 40 minutes time. My cats, welcome. Baruch Haban, sure. thank you for being with thank us. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Reb David, for a uh, wonderful Torah. I missed the Torah we learned together many, many, many years ago. Uh, so it was nice to have an opportunity here. You know, the experience of Dole Mashke, you know, when your students go on and teach their own Torah, it's a special moment. It's really an incredibly rewarding moment, a moment of nachat and pride and uh, really an incredible experience, which I wish for all of us. Um, Let's take 30 seconds of pausing. I feel like it's always Rashi, Rashi quotes how when God was teaching Moshe, God always even paused for a minute from one topic to another topic. So since we're going to switch into a very different topic, I think we'll, uh, it makes sense to pause for 30 seconds. So just 30 seconds of silence. People can take a little mental break. Okay. So we're going to get started. Um, Rav Yonah stressed one aspect of the uh, topic, which is uh, the most important guest, but I'm interested more in the neediest. Who is the neediest guest that comes to our Seder uh, on Pesach night? Um, so the truth is this, this setting is uh, not a setting that uh, I like very much, um, as I like to tell my students oftentimes that I actually don't like to teach. I like to schmooze, uh, but I teach Torah so that we have what to schmooze about. So the way this is set up and that makes it difficult to kind of have a conversation and a dialogue is a little bit um, a little bit not my mode, uh, but I will still start off with a little bit of a conversation if you can put it in your chats. And my question to you is as follows. Um, I always marvel when I look at the Gemara and Psachim. The Gemara and Psachim has a very in-depth conversation about a topic, which I'm not going to get into right now. And the Gemara is struggling to figure out why you do it that way and not that way. And I logically would have made of sense, would have made more sense to do it this way. And, and in the middle of this complex discourse, the Gemara comes out of left field and says, oh, you know what? Really, we should have done it that way, but we're doing it this way, Latmia as Hati no code, to make the kids wonder and be surprised. And it's kind of interesting to me when you when you're in the depth of that discourse to kind of expect a fancy, you know, academic answer to all of a sudden be confronted with, you know what? Actually, one of the primary values Pesach night is to do things that stand out in our memory that makes us notice, that makes us kind of remember. So, if a couple of you want to kind of maybe put in the chat. In your memory of your childhood at your parents' sedarim or your family's sedarim, is there a moment in particular that stands out as something that has made a impression on you, is embedded on your brain, and you always associate that with Pesach? Uh, I'm just curious, a few people, if they can either write it to Rav Yona, write it to me in the chat, and I'll uh, share that with you. And with that, we'll get started. I'll give people a minute to just write down something. Okay. Singing in Yiddish, okay, very nice. Spilling wine on the goddess. Yeah, those are all beautiful moments that, you know, whether we intentional or not, they leave an impression on us. Showing what others are. Okay, so I thought this is all the Yura Viona. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I received a reciting Mishar Otam, Oh, yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, fair. When I received a Megillat Esther for a present, yeah, very sweet. Very, very sweet. Okay. One or two more, and then we'll, 
being at my grandfather's table. Okay. Um, discussing the plagues. Okay. Uh, one more and then we'll move on. My mother's cousin was standing at a door when we opened the door for Elijah. Yeah, family out. Okay. I'm sure there are many, many more. Feel free to put yours in the chat, even if I don't um, read them out, maybe if we have time at the end, but it's just nice to share. So I have actually two. I have like a childish childhood memory of, of the Seder, and then I have more of an adult memory, and that's the one that I want to discuss with you. But first, the childhood memory is something that uh, one of you mentioned, which it is the, uh, the, the way the makot, the way the plagues were told. So... Uh, you need, what you need to know about this is my father was South American. My father grew up in Uruguay, uh, was an immigrant, didn't, didn't speak a, a, a proper English. And his point of references for non-Jews was usually mostly uh, from South America. And somehow his custom was always when it gets to the fourth makad, makav arov, where all the animals, you know, showed up and uh, devoured the Egyptians, he would kind of make this elaborate story about how a whole family, you know, uh, kind of, you know, dies because of the animals. And it was very sweet because his names are always Latino names. Uh, you know, so first I said, the father of Berto uh, would kind of go out and uh, want to get food for the family, and then he didn't come back. So then the mother, Yesenia, would go out and see where Roberto was. And then he would always look at the kids, the sons and the daughters. And they were always Latino names, because that's, that's what he knew. And it was always kind of to make the kids interested. And it's oh, every year when I do Arov, all I can think of is that Latino family that happened to be in Egypt that somehow was, um, was consumed by the Maka of Arov, was... Um, was uh, killed by the Maka of Arof. So that's a childhood memory. And I really think that that's an integral part of the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim, to find those moments that embed themselves in the audience's mind, whether they're adults or children, and then they remember it for uh, the rest uh, of their lives. An adult memory that I have, and that brings me to the, uh, to the uh, idea that I wanted to share with you tonight, is that before we started Magid, in other words, we said Magid, and everybody explained what Magid means. Before we get, got started with Manishtana, we would read a section from the Zohar. And, you know, for those of you who know my background, I grew up in a Hasidic home. I grew up in a Satmar family. So Kabbalah and mysticism and Hasidut was a big and integral part of uh, our kind of, you know, religious discourse and religious conversation. And this piece of Zohar that I want to share with you um, really introduced the Seder. And my father would read it with such, with just, with just, with just passion and with such enthusiasm. And really kind of, it set a tone for the entire evening. Now, I want to warn you, uh, for some of you, this might be kind of an incredibly um, interesting piece of Zohar. And for some of you, it might be a little bit of a foreign theology, uh, but that's fine, just, you know, Listen to it, absorb it, take it, and see what you want to do with it. So I'm going to share my screen, um, and I want to start by kind of introducing the pasuk, which I think is an incredibly powerful pasuk um, relating to the story, to the mitzvah of Sipur Yitzhiyaz Mitzrayim. And uh, I want to preface it by saying that when I read Sukim, I usually try to, um, try to, um, listen with a close ear to the tone, to the kind of impression that the pasuk gives. And here we have a pasuk that I feel, if you listen closely, you notice something very powerful, right? So I'll read it in English. It's in Parshat, in, uh, in, uh, in Shemot 10. It says, and then Hashem said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I've hardened his heart and the hearts of his courtiers in order that I may display these, my signs among them, and that may you you may recount in the ears of your child and your child child how I made a mockery of the Egyptians. Yeah? And the Hebrew is Ulaman Tesaper Right? So God says, I am gonna go really harsh on Pyro. I'm gonna go really harsh on the Egyptians. Why is that? Because I want you to tell the story, right? And already uh, to use a 
Heschelian term, there's an element of pathos in the language that God says, right? I want people to talk about me. I want people to tell my story. And the more, you know, wow, the story will be, the more the chance is that people will talk about it, right? That's what God says. I will be very harsh with the Egyptians. I want that story to be told. I want people to talk about that story. So the Zohar, uh, and again, this is a particular mystical um, theology, the Zohar picks up on this um, notion that God wants the story to be told. And the Zohar has a very beautiful and very vivid, vivid description of how that plays itself out on Pesach. And I want to go through that Zohar with you. Just as, and, and, and again, when I read the Zohar, every time I read the Zohar, I'm seeing my father in the beginning of the state of night, reading it with this kind of spiritual ecstasy, I would say. Okay, so let's see the Zohar. It's a nice, beautiful piece of Zohar. Uh, for those of you familiar with Zohar, Zohar tends to be redundant and repetitive. So the Zohar repeats its point multiple times, but it's it's kind of a nice uh, shtickle uh, story. Okay, again, um, just a quick um, little um, background information. Uh, the Zohar is made up of multiple books, um, and one of the books within the Zohar is called the Raya Mehemna. And the Raya Mehemna is a kind of book that goes through the Tariyag Mitzvot, right? And the reason why it's called Raya Mehemna is because Moshe Rabbeinu is considered the kind of, you know, devoted shepherd or the, 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 the trusty shepherd. And the rabbis attribute the Tariyag Mitzvot to Moshe Rabbeinu, right? And Gemara says, Tariyag Mitzvot namre la Moshe Messinai. God gave Moses 630 mitzvot. So when the Zohar discusses mitzvot, it's attributed to Moshe. So that section of the Zohar is called Raya Mehemna. So, Let's read in the English. Uh, if you're comfortable following the Aramaic, feel free to follow in the Aramaic. The next commandment, the Zohar says, is to tell the praises of the exodus from Egypt. For it is an obligation for a person to speak of these praises for all eternity. We have to talk about the story that had happened in Egypt throughout our lives. Thus, we have established a person who speaks about exodus from Egypt and rejoices joyously in that story. In the future, they will rejoice in the Shekhinah in the world to come. In other words, if you're celebrating God's you know, success in Egypt, you will be rewarded by being in the presence of God in Olam Haba, which is the greatest joy of all, for they are a person who rejoices in their master, and the Holy Beast be blessed one rejoices in this story. And now comes the important part. At that time, the Zohar says, when the story of the Exodus is being told, in other words, at your Seder, Seder night, the Holy Blessed One gathers together all of the heavenly hosts and says to them, come, the better, the better translation would be, come, because God comes along, come and listen to the telling of my praises. For right now, my children are speaking and rejoicing in my salvation. You know what? God takes such pleasure God said such pride in the fact that we are thankful and indebted to our Kaddish Baruch that God kind of shows up to his entourage and says, come, let's see how joyous and how happy my children are with uh, what I did for them. Immediately, they all gather and come and connect themselves together with the people of Israel and listen to their telling of praises for when Israel rejoices in the joy of their master's salvation, the heavenly hosts go and give thanks to the Holy Blessed One for all the miracles and feats, and they give thanks to God for the holy nation that God has on the earth who rejoices in the joy of their master's salvation. And again, I, 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 full confession, like I said, I grew up in a home that's very Hasidic, very mystical, very Kabbalistic. By the time my father would read that, you would feel that he felt Ilu, God and the entire Pamalia Shalmala, the entire entourage is coming down to our table. And it kind of set the tone for the entire night. The night was a night of, you know, um, dwelling in the presence of the divine, but in the presence of a divine that is in need of us. And that's kind of what's important about this piece of Zohar, right? This is um, what um, um, Gershom Shalom, the famous um, scholar of Kabbalah, used to say always, mitzvot tzorach gevoha. 
in the Zohar, there is this notion that we don't do mitzvot just for our sake. We do mitzvot for God's sake. And the Zohar goes on very powerfully again. For some of you, this might be very foreign and anathema. Um, I'm going to put the source sheets uh, in, the, in the chat it's later for everybody uh, to have all these sources. At that time, the Zohar says, strength and power are increased on high. And in their telling of the story, story Israel grants strength to that master, right? And, and, and it might be a little bit of foreign language to us, but the Zohar gives us license to think of God the way Heschel used to talk about God, right? God in search of man. God needs us just as much as we need God. Like a king whose strength and power is increased when his people praise his power and give thanks to him, and all are gripped with fear in his presence, and the king's honor is spread over everyone. For this purpose, one should give praise and tell the story, the story of Itziat Mitzrayim, as has been said. In a similar way, it's incumbent upon every person to speak constantly before the Holy Blessed One and to publicize all the miracles that God has performed. So, in other words, what the Zohar is telling us is that when we tell the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, true, there's an element of telling our story, right? We're telling our children about our redemption, our uh, you know, successes and our triumphs. There is also an element of the divine redemption. There's also an element of where God comes down to us in our home, in our family, looking for affirmation, looking for celebration, because, as I said, and as Heschel stressed over and over and over again, God in search of man. We live in a world where we recognize, where we appreciate that it is a, what, 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 what others have called as well, it is a mutual relationship. It's not a one-sided relationship where we are subservient, and especially on the night of Fesach. On the night of Pesach, it's not a night of subservience and servitude. It's a night of mutual celebration where we celebrate our redemption and God wants us to celebrate the divine redemption, so to speak, the divine ability to have an audience and a community that is interested in worshiping him. And I just, I said, uh, for, my, for me, um, for me, uh, this gave a certain sense uh, of the Seder that otherwise we didn't have in the sense that we're not there to tell, you know, uh, we were persecuted, we were saved, now let's eat. We're actually tell what is the dynamic of our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I will only say, I'll only add to that uh, two points that I wanted to make is that, um, let me share my screen with you. Um, Rabbi, Katz, Rabbi Katz, just a quick program note to everyone that we placed the sources into the yeah, chat. You yeah, the chat, the chat there's, a, the there's a link. Yeah. And if anybody wants the sources, um, feel free um, to uh, use them um, for your Seder or whatever, uh, whenever you want to use them, feel free. Um, I will just share. So this is, like I said, this is the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, book of Heschel, where Heschel writes, um, in English, it was written in English and was translated the Hebrew, God in search of man, uh, and someone who loves art and all kinds of art, uh, the art on the book, on the Hebrew version of the book, comes from this original, um, you know, mosaic. Uh, it's a, a sixth century mosaic showing the story of Ab Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, which I think is an incredible way of reading the story of the Akedah. For Heschel, the Akedah is a story not about Abraham, but about God, about God's desperate need of human dedication and human commitment and human uh, interest. And I will just say, when it comes to telling the story, two models that I have, in fact, uh, you know, uh, before we go to the story, is that if you look at the Aseret Adibrod, when God tells the Jews, you know, you should believe in me because I'm your God, what does God say? I, Hashem, am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Now, what's missing here in this verse? What is God not saying? God says, I am the one who took you out of Egypt, of the house of bondage. What, which aspect of the divine is not mentioned in this first uh, commandment? Anybody want to write in the chat? 
when God kind of, kind of tries to identify, so to speak, himself or themselves, which is the aspect of the divine that's not mentioned and which is the aspect of the divine that is mentioned. Wonderful, thank you. All right, it doesn't say I am the God who created the world. It says I am the God who has taken you out of Egypt. Embedded in that is a request of, I want to be part of the story you tell. The fact that I created you, that's secondary to the fact that I am present in the narrative that you tell of how you got here and what happened to you. And that kind of reinforces the notion of the Zohar that God needs us as much as we need God. I'm your God. And you know why, I, why you should like me? Because I was there with you in Egypt. I'm part of your story. So I'm just going to say two, part, two uh, you know, observations about storytelling. One of them is about our son, and I'll share with you a little picture of our children, two beautiful children. This is from many, many years ago. They are significantly bigger uh, uh, than this picture. And anybody recognize uh, where this is? It's somewhere in Europe. Does anybody recognize where this is? Who, who, knows, who knows their Europe and can recognize where this is? Anybody? I can't see the chat. So, if you want to, did anybody write in the chat? It's a very prominent historical um, site. Someone just put a uh, David Wallenfeld. A number of people are now saying the Brandenburg Gate. Yes, exactly. Right. Wonderful. So, this is the Brandenburg Gate. We were there one summer, and our kids were, um, you know, two or three or two and four, three or four, and we told them the story. And somehow the big part of the story that we told them was the line from Ronald Reagan, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. And the kids were so intrigued by the story that I'm not exaggerating. By the time we were done, we were there for about 10 days, we told the story around 30, 40 times. And I'm not exaggerating. Like an average couple of times a day, our kids would say, so can you tell the story again, Abba? And it made me appreciate the beauty of a kid who learns the story for the first time and each time learns something more. Each time learns something new. They want to hear the story because each time they internalize it further and further and further. And each time there was an aspect that somehow they didn't notice. And I think that's something that's a challenge for us when we, uh, when we tell the story, especially for those of us who have uh, told, this, told the story many, many times. It's like, okay, we know the story already. But no, there's always new aspects to the story. There's always new angles to the story that we have to uh, try to look for and identify. Uh, and I'll just end with one more um, story, which apparently I'm told that I have a different version than what most people here uh, have heard, but it's the story with the Santa Rena that I love to tell always. So um, Santa Rena, for those of you who don't know, is a book that has all the stories of Tanakh in Yiddish. And it used to be a book that uh, women and uh, children, mostly women who didn't have the ability to read Hebrew, they would um, read the Tzanarena each week. So the story that I was told when I was a kid was um, that there was this woman who uh, read it each week, the Parsha in the Tzanarena, and she took the story very, very seriously. Uh, and each week she kind of sympathized with Cain and Havel, and then later on with uh, Lot and the daughters and so on and so forth. And somehow her peak emotional distress came with the story of Yosef, right? So Jacob, Jacob, Jacob sends his, uh, Joseph to his brothers and the brothers kind of, you know, first drop him in the pit and then they sell him to the Egyptians. And she got so emotional. And so overwhelmed as she's crying her heart out about how sad and how difficult um, Yosef's uh, life is, uh, is going. And that's it. Next year, again, she starts the cycle again. She starts from the beginning. She reads the story in the, the book of Genesis. And then she gets to the end of the book of Genesis. And she reads how Yaakov, Jacob, wants to send Joseph to, to his brothers. And she starts crying. She says... Joseph, don't go. Don't you remember what happened last year? <laughs> what's beautiful about the story is this woman lived the story. She experienced it as if it was happening. And as much as we can you know, laugh and make fun, it is a skill. 
it is a skill. When the rabbis say, everybody has to experience as if they left Egypt, it's something that you have to prepare yourself. It doesn't happen over um, just like that when you sit down to the Seder. Um, so I'll wrap up. I need, I have, I'm running out of time. Um, so my answer to the neediest guest showing up to the Seder, if you're inclined to this kind of theology, you can find that incredibly powerful. I know for me, it adds a layer to the Seder uh, that otherwise is not there, which tells me I am doing something for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's number one. And number two, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is present at the Seder. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there to hear us say that. And I think just as our kids, and just as this woman read at Sinarena, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is coming every year because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to hear pieces of the story that we have not yet stressed and identified the year before and the year before and the year before. So when you say, Kol dichfin anybody who is hungry should come and eat, if you're so inclined to think uh, about God in such personal terms, think of it being also an invitation to say, Akadosh Baruch Hu, why don't you come join us for the Seder? Uh, we are dependent. It's, there's a mutual dependency between the two of us. We need you to help us, to make us, give us a better life. Uh, the world needs God to intervene and make a better world. But we also know that God needs us to recognize God because as the Zohar famously says, um, the Midrash, I'm sorry, says, Ein melech below am. There's no such a thing as a king without a subject. We are the subjects, and without us, Akadosh Baruch Hu basically has nothing. Okay. We have about 10 minutes right now. So if people want to place questions in the chat, either to me or to Rabbi Katz. So oh, I'm stop. sorry. I didn't realize that yeah. I had to 920. I'm sorry. Rabbi Katz, yeah. uh, ever, you know, a famous uh, Hasidic Rabbi once told me that everyone knows that a Hasidic. Uh, 9 10 doesn't mean exactly 9 20, but you, <laughs> no, 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 uh, you I was that a little up, bit I tonight. Do you have a few, if you want to talk for another few minutes, take questions. No, 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 no. People yeah. want to ask questions, share Rebecca experiences. Shah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I Rebecca totally Shah. was thrown up. I'm sorry. I great. apologize. Great. No problem. This is great. Any Anyone have any questions, observations, please feel free to place them into the chat at this time. Just make sure you're writing to myself or to Rabbi Katz. I want to, I'll actually start with something that's on my mind, uh, and this relates to something that we heard from a little earlier from Rabbi Kasher as well, which is, and I'm putting this sort of in, my, in the mindset of, of the child, right? Uh, you know, the child comes home with this corpus that they have to share, you know, from beginning to end, every little thing that they learn from their teacher, every question they have, every song that they want to sing. And usually we think, at least myself, we think of God as this overarching, big, old, right? Beyond the normal scope of, of time and space. And the fact that God is joining us, sitting at that table with us, you know, sort of an Eliyahu-esque kind of figure. Uh, I really feel that as a sense of presence of, wow, there's someone else I need to tell the story to in a very different kind of way. And it's almost like a young new figure, which is very different from my normal perception of, of God, of HaKadosh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Right, right. right. I mean, I will say, though, um, and if people want to um, chime in, um, then please. Um, one thing I will share with, uh, with, uh, with you about the, um, the way I grew up is that, um, like I said, the Zohar was a, a really central part of the Seder, and I have this beautiful memory of my father reading it. And it was not read. It was kind of really, it was kind of more of a liturgical experience. And of course, obviously, you read it in the Aramaic. Uh, if you're going to read it, you're a Seder and you're comfortable with the Aramaic, of course, I would encourage you uh, to read it in the Aramaic. Um, and, 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 and something that's interesting about this is that um, I teach a class on the Zohar. I teach a class on the Zohar at the yeshiva. And um, I tell my students always when, at the beginning of the class that the orientation will be a mix of my father and a friend of ours. And what I mean by that is that my father was a chassid, a real chassid from, you know, the old, the, the old, the old, the old uh, shtatl chassid, really loved HaKadosh Baruch Hu, loved his family because he loved HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and really kind of walked around in this world with a intimate 
sense of God. He felt close to God. He felt, um, you know, owed to God. Um, but there was also a certain degree of deference and reverence um, that you felt all the time uh, of, that he kind of exuded. And for him, the Zohar was a holy text. The Zohar was a sacred holy text. Uh, in fact, uh, we had the Zohar in our uh, living room. It was one of the uh, books in the bookshelf. And uh, my father would sometimes, you know, blackmail us with that. He would say, you know, if we were misbehaved at the Shabbos table, which was in the living room, say, I, I can't believe you do this in the presence of the Zohar. There's the Zohar in the closet, you know, like what's going on with you? And it always worked, especially if you spoke Lashon Hara. If we spoke Lashon Hara, he would always say, I can't believe you sang Lashon Hara in front of the Zohar. What's wrong with you? Uh, but he really meant it. For him, the Zohar was a sacred text um, that he uh, took very seriously. And I tell my students all the time that I contrast that with a friend of ours who is a professor um, of Zohar. He teaches Zohar at, um, at Hebrew University or Tel Aviv University. I don't remember exactly. Uh, some of you might know his name. Boaz Hus is his name. Uh, he is a professor of Zohar in, in Israel. And uh, we spent summers in Tel Aviv. And um, one day we were with a family at the beach um, without getting into the details, but I was certainly not wearing my Strymel Bekesha. And I'm walking at the beach and there I'm seeing Boas coming towards me also in beach clothes. And he said to me, Saskar, you know, I just read the Zohar and I'm curious what you think about it. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, the contrast between the way my father treated the Zohar and the way Boaz re treated the Zohar is really heaven and earth. And I think that for, for me, I guess I can't tell other people what to do. For me, that blend uh, really resonates deeply in the sense that, of course, the Zohar is a modern text. Um, you know, I don't live with an assumption that the Zohar was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It is a modern text, but in history, historically, for Kali Yisrael, for people, it carried a significant sacredness. And I think that the ability to treat texts as sacred and as, um, you know, something with metaphysical significance is something that it's nice to adopt, you know? Um, we don't have to worship the Zohar. We can critic, critic, criticize the Zohar. We can challenge the Zohar. But I think it's also nice sometimes to kind of allow ourselves, allow ourselves to kind of be in that Zoharic space, to be in that space of, uh, you know, an intimacy with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and an intimacy that is willing to say, God is needy. God needs us in order to kind of be fully uh, recognized and fully actualized. Um, and um, I think that was the beauty of Heschel's um, theology is that Heschel gave us that license to kind of really develop an intimacy with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but it's an intimacy that's not hierarchical, right? It's not just, oh, we are, the subser we are subservient to God and we serve as God. Uh, it's, an, it, it's an intimacy that is mutual that it's mutually dependent. Um, and in fact, um, already from earlier sources, there is this idea of why do we say Shema before the Amidah? Why do we say the Shema before the Amidah? I mean, what does Torah have to do with liturgy? We're in the middle of praying, we're in the middle of davening, and there in the middle inserted is some psukim of Torah. And already someone way back when, I'm, rem I'm not remembering exactly who said it, but it's not Heschel or anybody else said, you know, before we are setting ourselves up to ask something from God, we say, God, listen, you asked something from us. You gave us a, a Torah with 613 commandments, 613 requests. You are dependent on us. You want us to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and now it's our turn to kind of ask in return. And again, setting up a different kind of dynamic between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu that is a dynamic of mutuality, a dynamic of mutually dependence and a, demand, a dynamic that is dialogical, that is dialogical, that kind of has this kind of, you know, um, silent conversation, if such a thing is possible, um, where if we listen closely, we can kind of hear, like I said in the beginning, when the Torah says, Lamant to Saper, I hear a pathos in that. God says, please, I want you to tell my story because if nobody tells my story, I'm pointless. 
You know, ain't melech below am. If there's nobody who talks about God or nobody who services God, then God is not God. Um, and I think that um, even if you're not inclined um, to kind of live that way, uh, maybe it's worth to give it a try this year. Maybe this year when you sit down to the Seder, see if you uh, share this Zohar with your family, have everybody say it. And like I said, if people feel comfortable saying it in the Aramaic, uh, it's nicer. Uh, it's the language that has been said for many, many years. Um, and if not, feel free to do it in English and see how it goes. See how it goes. Okay. about two minutes left. I'm watching uh, Rabbi Rachel is still speaking in the other room, so we can keep going a little bit more if that's okay. If um, anybody has to, any reactions. Uh, just a quick, yeah, uh, just a quick Baruch Haba to our friend and colleague, Rabbi Ronnie Kahana, who's joining us from uh, from Montreal. I see he's on, uh, Rabbi Edelman, others. Um, Rabbi Katz, I, I wonder if this is a new understanding for us of, of B'nai Chori, right? We think always, you know, the way we, at least the way I always understood the Haggadah, right? It's, it's almost a joke, right? Oh, Hashem takes us out of Avdut, out of the slavery of Egypt, and then all of a sudden, the mitzvot, the Torah, piled on, right? And Kapal and Har Kegigit, the Nidrash says, God holds the mountain over us, and it's almost as if we, don't, if we don't do it, that's it. It's over, right? And so I'm wondering, this is a new, you know, the, the, the Hasidic way of understanding this brings people to a very different sense of relationship with mitzvah, with commandment, with God, uh, and with their own sense of self in this post-Exodus world. Um, and that's jarring for people. So I'm wondering how people get there, and what does that do for us in terms of our sense of, of connection with mitzvah, which often feels very right. much like it's a responsibility. Yeah. Right, right, right. So so, so, so I, I, I am sorry to, um, to kind of uh, plug last year's uh, presentation, but I think it's two it years ago fits. and we'll share we have it shared already on the website. People can see it. We'll send the link around as well. Yeah. Sure. So 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 I will say that um you know um maybe it's a radical idea, but I deeply believe that. Um you know Rashi, the first Rashi in Bereshit says, oh why does the Torah start with the stories? The Torah should have started with uh the laws. Um and I wonder, I wonder, uh, I would argue that perhaps according to some, you know, Hasidic uh, um, um, theologians, Rashi's question is actually uh, incorrect. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that, in fact, the stories are what it is primarily about. And we have the mitzvot as a means to create a certain persona that then can go and develop a narrative and a story. So, in fact, the mitzvot are the means, the story is the end. And again, I'm going back to the first verse that, we, uh, that I quoted to you. God does not say, oh, I'm going to take them out of Egypt so that they can do my mitzvot. I'm going to take them out of Egypt. Rabbi Kasher also quoted the Pasuk, V'yigadetala bincha. I think B'nai Chorin, freedom means having a story. When we say this year we are B'nai Chorin, what we mean is we have a story. We have a narrative because a slave, an enslaved person does not have a narrative because they're not in control of the narrative. So I actually believe that the purpose of Yitzhak Mitzrayim is that we can be B'nai Chorin who can have a narrative, who can have a story. And then God gave us the mitzvot to create a certain kind of persona, a certain kind of um, being in this world that allows for the story to flourish. But our primary purpose, and I'm going back again to Anoch Hashem Alakacha, and then I'll end. It doesn't say Anoch Hashem Alakacha Shabaraticha. It doesn't say I'm the God that created you. It doesn't say I'm the God that gave you the Torah. It says, Anochi Hashem Alakacha, Asher Hetzaticha, my Eretz Mitzrayim. I'm the God that redeemed you for Egypt. I am part of the story and make sure to incorporate you, me in your story. So I think that's kind of what's unique and makes religion in general and Judaism in particular special is that everybody has a story. You don't have to be religious to have a story. But if you're religious, your story involves also a mutuality between the divine 
and us. Um, and I think on Pesach in particular, uh, that's when the story kind of kickstart, you know, gets this kickstart and gets start um, starts off. Um, we start telling the story of a relationship that finally was able to kind of be actualized. Why we were slaves, we were not able to worship God. Why we were slaves, God did not have us. And on Pesach, that mutual relationship of mutual dependence, of mutual neediness, um, kicks off and evolves. And every year it's different. You know, some years uh, the relationship is wonderful. Some years the relationship is not so great. You know, like a couple is oftentimes kind of reflect on how was the year. Um, and the Pesach story each year will be different if the story of Pesach is the story of their relationship and how that relationship evolved, how much of it, um, you know, did we do our part? How much did God do, so to speak, his part? So, yeah, for me, that's that's a big part of what Torah and mitzvot are. The Torah starts with the story because that is where it starts and the mitzvot are there to enhance that, to enrich that.